Hello and welcome to The Library is Not a Restaurant, Reference Appointments in Neoliberal Language. I'm Carolyn Caffrey Gardner and I'm joined today by Maggie Clark. Hi. My name is Maggie Clark and I am the Reference Coordinator here at Cal State Dominguez Hills. And I am the Information Literacy Coordinator also at Cal State Dominguez Hills. So let's go ahead and get started. Hey, so welcome to our talk. Um, I'm going to start by giving you a little bit of background information about our institution and sort of how um, our model works to give you some context to understand the rest of what we're going to talk about today. So Cal State Dominguez Hills, of course, is part of the Cal State system. We're one of the smaller campuses with about 14,000 students. We're public comprehensive and we serve a high percentage of first gen students. We're a Hispanic serving institution and also um, Cal State Dominguez Hills has a long history of service to the black community in South LA. So that's another important value on our campus. In our library, we have 11 librarians who do reference. We are all faculty status, but we also operate in a tiered reference model. So under normal circumstances, um, we have a physical research help desk lo located in the library, which is staffed by our student assistants who act as kind of the first line in um, answering in-person queries. Uh, they cover questions related to using our library services, related to printing and scanning in the library, as well as some very basic getting started with research. And then they refer questions that are more advanced research to librarians. Our librarians staff our chat um, reference services every day, Monday to Friday. Um, and this is where the majority of our sort of more reference or research related questions come in. So librarians step that and then act as sort of backup to the physical reference desk when necessary. Uh, that's it. Everything I've just described is basically on hold for the moment because of course we are living in pretty unprecedented times. Uh, due to COVID, our physical library building has been closed since I believe March. Um, which means that our physical reference help desk is not available to students and our student assistants aren't currently staffing it. Um, we're hoping to bring them back soon. But at the moment, all of our research support services are offered online and that includes our uh, research consultations, which we are offering exclusively via Zoom at the moment. Um, in addition to our sort of on-demand research help services that we offer at our desk and through chat, we also offer one-on-one -on -one or small group consultations for students to meet with librarians about more specific research questions, larger projects, um, or if they kind of want some one-on-one -on -one support in, for example, getting started with their research. Uh, these have been really popular with our students, um, and we have a lot of uh, users who make use of this, um, lots of repeat users. But unfortunately, we were also noticing that we had a lot of users making appointments and not showing up to them, which, as you can see from our slide, is a big womp womp. Um, this is unfortunate for a lot of reasons. Um, of course, you know, we require that our consultations be scheduled 24 hours in advance, and that's because our librarians use that time to prepare to meet with a student, maybe to do a little bit of research. Um, in advance on what their topic is, uh, maybe get a better sense of their uh, assignment. We try to you know, communicate via email before meeting if possible. Um, so when a student doesn't show up, not only is that hour or half hour that has been sort of claimed on their schedule by the person who made the appointment then sort of wasted, um, but all of the time that went into preparing for the appointment as well. Um, Additionally, you know, our librarians, of course, we love reference, but we have many responsibilities, lots of meetings, um, we do a lot of instruction, as well as just day-to-day sort of -day work. Um, and the more time that is taken up on our schedules by appointments made by students, the less time there is available for other students to make appointments. So we were experiencing some complaints from students and even faculty that um, students who wanted to meet with a librarian were unable to because there just wasn't enough availability from our librarians. And part of that is because students were making appointments and not showing up to them. You know, a common pattern we would sometimes see as a student maybe making multiple appointments at many different times and just sort of picking and choosing which one they were going to come to, if they would come to any at all. 
um, or perhaps someone panicked making an appointment the night before and then realizing 24 hours later they had actually figured it out and probably didn't need to go and then just not come in. Um, so all of that was throwing a little bit of a wrench in our workflow for appointments as well as our other duties. So we thought it was important for us to take a look at it. Yeah, and I'll add, um, I felt like I was getting the most um, missed appointments. So this is partially why um, I got really interested, even though I'm not the ref coordinator. Um, well, overall, we were around 30% of missed appointments. There were some months where I had like 70% missed appointments. Um, and I hope it's not anything uh, personal. So as we started to investigate this to figure out um, what we should do, how we could, you know, maybe um, change the way we were talking about appointments or other kinds of interventions, um, we started to notice that um, in addition to kind of having this no-show problem with reference, we were finding that as we explored this problem, we also recognized a lot of use of neoliberal language and ideology within our reference model. And so there's a lot of different definitions. Um, I'm using in particular sort of a definition um, gathered from Ian Balin's piece. And really this can be sort of shortly and briefly defined as the extension of market ideology and practices into non-market spaces, such as higher education, such as libraries and reference. Um, so you might see this in terms of language about return on investment or efficiencies, um, things of that nature. And we saw that as well with our reference appointments. In particular, we noticed that we pretty much exclusively talk about reference in terms of transactions. The statistics keeping system we use, um, that's the default language. That's the language that was being asked by our administrators, and that's how we were referring to it to each other, but also to students and other faculty. Um, what kinds of transactional approaches might we have? So even though these were non-monetary transactions, we found that the language around transactions represented appointments as sort of a passive consumption of information, um, which is of course just not what we wanted, um, both for our own um, pedagogy at the reference desk or uh, how we wished students to be engaged. In addition, while we've been calling these things appointments, other places might call them consultations or um, professors might call this kind of work office hours. And we had settled on appointments in part because of the statistics and calendaring systems we used, that was the default language, but we recognize that this is also sending signals to users about what an appointment is, where else do you get an appointment, what other spaces. Usually again, with that financial um, transaction involved, thinking about things like the doctor's office or a restaurant reservation. We also, in the way that our language um, talked about appointments, recognized, well, there is scarcity. The way in which it was structured and our no-show problem was really highlighting scarcity. You know, if you make this appointment, another student can't make an appointment and, ah, appointments are preventing me from doing X, Y, Z. So there were these real sort of pressures and manufactured crises, which can be kind of the hallmarks of neoliberal thinking as well. And again, there was an increased focus on efficiency. How can we serve the most number of students possible in a way that is extremely efficient, which a half an hour research appointment might not necessarily be seen as efficient. However, it's very beneficial and transform, uh, transformative educational experience for those students. We also found that um, we were having to sort of justify why we did this kind of service and having statistics on appointments um, also kind of served within that larger uh, neoliberal ideology. So we have an example of what this actually looked like in practice, um, what kinds of neoliberal um, ideology was sort of persistent and sneaky. And one of the things that um, Chris Borg mentions in her piece, which we have cited at the end, is that um, the pervasiveness of neoliberalism is partially what makes it so um, troubling and um, sneaky. And so um, this doesn't on its face seem super obvious, but um, this was a common phrase from both library administrators and um, within our own offices. What happens if a student needs an appointment right now? And so one of the things that you can see in this common hypothetical question that I have yet to actually encounter in the real world is um, from librarians, we were asking this question of each other with concerns about justification and those evaluation metrics and how we were being compared to each other. What happens if I miss an appointment? 
And from administration, this question came bundled typically with other expectations, like what minimum number of appointments are you doing per day? Um, how are you serving your liaison area with radically different numbers of enrolled students? And the idea of research help as being sort of a quick service. There's also this idea that students in crisis of needing a transactional answer rather than a one-on-one -on -one sort of deep educational session. Um, so in this example, we see hallmarks of sort of this neoliberal ideology, this focus on a customer service disposition, manufacturer crisis, scarcity, competition, et cetera. In this situation, all librarians and all students and their research needs sort of become interchangeable widget-like experiences. Is there anything that you have to add to this example, Maggie? It was super common for us. Um, I think I would also add that many of our librarians sort of come to this question, I think from a space of concern for students and that is tied to that sort of manufactured crisis all the time, since we're often sort of inundated with these ideas that students, you know, are in a state of research emergency and require us to sort of triage them um, with dire potential consequences, like what if this is the paper that leads them to drop out of college and then they never get to achieve their dreams. Um, so I just sort of want to call out that I think a lot of, you know, I won't speak for admin, but I'll speak for myself and uh, my colleagues who I've talked to about this, but I think a lot of us were coming to this from a place of trying to be uh, empathetic and student-centered. Um, but in reality, sort of by not engaging with, engaging more critically with this as an even, as a question to even be asking ourselves, I feel like we were sort of maybe uncritically participating in an exercise in neoliberalism without uh, perhaps realizing it. Definitely. So we still, well, we have been kind of thinking about these ideas about neoliberalism and recognizing that the language and way we frame appointments might be an issue as well. We also wanted to know what are other libraries doing? Are we the only people who get no-shows? Have other people fixed this? And so we um, conducted a survey. We tried to create a stratified sample based on geographic region using methodology adapted from Sobel and Sugimoto's 2012 article. Uh, to boil down what is very sophisticated into a short sentence, we made a giant spreadsheet from NCES is Educational Statistics from College Navigator, and it's broken up into geographic regions of the US. We were looking at bachelor granting institutions with more than 700 students, and then you essentially use a random number generator to pick 10% of all of those institutions. We boiled that down to a slightly more manageable number for us, and then we sent out surveys um, to folks identified on the website as coordinating or leading reference services where we were able to identify that. If we couldn't, we typically sent to a generic sort of reference email and 37 um, institutions responded. Our biggest question on the survey was really about how misappointments are addressed, handled. We provided a definition for appointments, which includes advance notice and um, sort of some sort of need to register or note an interest in an appointment ahead of time. And yet um, virtually zero of the libraries that we contacted um, consistently tracked or addressed missed appointments. Um, folks typically said, well, I keep track of appointments that are missed for me, um, but we didn't find a lot of coordinated approaches with the exception of, I believe, one institution. So we also asked what percentage of your reference transactions are appointments and how much notice do you ask students to provide? And most of the libraries, appointments make up a small portion of their overall reference traffic. And that's true for us too. So even though our appointments might be less than 10% of our overall reference numbers, um, they do represent that significant, significant time investment. And we like to hope um, students also get more out of them than maybe some of the other questions we receive. Now, even though we provided that definition about advance notice, when we asked folks, how much notice do you provide? 40% of respondents said, no notice. Students can walk up and get an appointment anytime. And so one of the challenges that we found is between institutions, even within our own institution, so how the writing center does stuff or how the tutoring center does stuff, um, everybody's kind of using different language around appointments. And so students are coming from some situations where like a doctor's office might require an advance notice. 
um, to schedule an appointment to maybe a library where an appointment is a drop-in service that's provided and we would argue maybe like not an appointment, just a drop-in consultation. Other things we noticed from our survey results is that when instructors required appointments, many of the institutions commented that they had more iffy attendance. Um, so this was a, a situation certainly at our institution where instructors would, as a matter of course, as a matter of points for a particular assignment, mandate that students make an appointment with us either um, as a requirement or for extra credit um, participation. There was also just general lack of consensus over how appointments as a service model were um, being evaluated or used between all of those particular institutions. So I'll turn it back to Maggie now to talk about the changes we implemented um, as a result of thinking about neoliberalism and the survey results that we found as well. So as Carolyn mentioned, um, the survey was conducted in the academic year 18-19, 2018-2019. Um, so in this most recent year, our own academic year 1920, we've been uh, implementing some changes that we hope to, we hope will address um, some of the patterns that we've seen in other libraries, as well as uh, some of the um, potential neoliberal roots of our own no-show issue. Um, one very simple change that we made that has, I think, made a big difference um, is to change our reservation policy to require that students, of course, as they are able, um, make their own appointments. Previous to this, we had had a practice of allowing particularly student assistants at the research help desk, but also librarians working on chat to make appointments for students um, who, you know, maybe we felt like would benefit from that service. The transaction would often sort of look like oh, this is a bigger question than I can answer in these five minutes here at the research help desk. Why don't I make an appointment for you with the librarian? Um, our appointment scheduling, we use uh, the LibApps tool, LibCal, and we have sort of an integrated scheduling form on our website. And we now require that students make their own appointments. Um, the goal here is for students to sort of have to spend a little bit of extra time you know, thinking about what they're hoping to get out of the appointment. We ask in the form for a little bit of information about what research they're conducting or what questions they have, um, which gives them an opportunity to think through a little bit why they're making an appointment and what they hope to get out of it, as well as thinking through um, maybe a little bit more closely the time and date, of course, of their appointment. Um, I know that being confronted with a calendar physically forces me to think about like, okay, what am I actually doing this day? Can, is three o'clock really gonna work? Rather than, you know, perhaps it being suggested by another person and me just saying, okay, yeah, that's fine, whatever. Um, additionally, we've made some changes to, in the way we uh, communicate, particularly on our website with students about um, appointments, giving them um, a little bit more information and sort of context to help them determine, you know, if an appointment is right for them and as well as how long their appointment should be. So this screenshot is an example from a revamped uh, research support page on our website. And this particular section is specifically about research appointments. Um, previously, we didn't have this quite this level of sort of robust contextual information to help guide students through the process of making an appointment. And there's a few things that we sort of try to subtly highlight in this text um, to encourage students to think about, you know, what they're hoping to get out of an appointment as well as how long of an appointment they need. An issue that uh, anecdotally I've seen come up in the past um, would be that perhaps a student doesn't know how long they would like to meet with the librarian, so they just default to the most that they can have, which is 60 minutes. Um, and then of course, when you meet with them, uh, it's a question that perhaps doesn't take 60 minutes to answer. Um, so for example, under the section, how long are consultations, we provide a little bit of context, letting them know that our librarians you know, serve the whole campus and that a 60 minute appointment is really for if you think you need 60 minutes of research help if you're working on a larger project, um, that we recommend 30 minutes as a good place to get started, which is what most of our students who make appointments are coming in for, although by no means all. 
Um, so this is just a piece of that page. There's more sort of similar messaging elsewhere on our website, and we're also uh, endeavoring to you know, mirror this in the way we talk to students about consultations as well, which has involved a lot of conversations between uh, our reference staff, which is mostly made up of our librarian faculty, but also our student assistants, who I think traditionally had been sort of left out of the loop on some of this strategizing. Um, so I think a big difference in changing the way we communicate with our students about research appointments has been sort of looping our student assistants in on some of this information as well and creating easily accessible tools like a web page where they can sort of direct students for help with this. Okay, so additionally, um, we've made some changes in our own practices as well as our work with our fellow faculty who are teaching courses more regularly um, to, how do I wanna put this? I would say maybe like change their expectations. Yes. Um, because they were also viewing it as sort of this like passive transactional experience. Yeah. <clears throat> so we've also um, endeavored to change the way that we work with our fellow faculty members and provide a little bit more information to help set the expectations that faculty have from these appointments. I think when we see particularly faculty for example, requiring all students in a class to make an appointment with the librarian. Um, I think that sort of represents, to me, a misunderstanding of what the appointment system is for, the mis a misunderstanding of um, what a consultation with the librarian can actually do to benefit the student. I think it often comes from a perspective of, I want you to fix my student's research. Like, we often see this after a first draft of an assignment has been turned in, the instructor panics and says, all of these are bad. You all need to talk to a librarian to figure out how to do research. And then suddenly we see an influx of appointments from you know, whatever class. Um, often from students who have no idea why they're meeting with us. You know, we don't really get in too much in this particular, in this to, uh, sort of the qualitative aspects of what we do in research appointments, um, but part of, you know, setting up the way, setting up how students, their disposition to this appointment when they come to us is that we want them to know why they're there, which feels very basic, but um, I think is not always on the top of the mind of other faculty. So we wanted to help set their expectations for what a research appointment looks like and what we can sort of realistically do and also frame it as an educational opportunity um, rather than, again, this sort of one and done transaction that we often see reflected in the language that we use to talk about this. So one way we do this is to use um, statistics, particularly from our chats, but also from um, our in-person transactions. We've begun uh, recording when we are able, what course questions come from. So, you know, what course a question is related to so that we can identify courses where you know, if all of a sudden you're seeing the same questions about using SciFinder, and now I can look at our stats and see, oh, a bunch of students from Chemistry 490 have been, answer, have been asking questions about this, and now we're starting to see them make appointments. That is, to me as our reference coordinator, an opportunity for intervention with that instructor um, to maybe brainstorm other solutions. You know, perhaps research appointments are what is needed, but maybe what's really needed is, you know, an information literacy session to go over some basic skills with the whole class or to cover how to use a database to make sure they have the information and abilities they need to complete their assignment. Um, we've also been, um, we ask about the course a student is working on when they make an appointment. So we can also get similar information from looking at, you know, perhaps an influx of appointments, if we see that they are all from the same English class, that is, you know, an early cue that, oh, I wonder if this instructor has told all of their students they have to make an appointment because, or if it's just a coincidence that 40 students from English 110 have decided to make an appointment this week. And again, that for me is an amazing opportunity to sort of intervene with that instructor and then talk to them a little bit about 
what a research appointment is and sort of brainstorm perhaps a more um, pedagogically sound intervention. So overall, if you look at academic, the past academic year as a whole, which of course, you know, I feel like I don't even need to offer, offer this caveat, but I will. Of course, it was an unusual year. Um, we've seen about a 4% reduction overall in our rate of no-shows, which does not sound like a massive difference, but there is sort of a significant outlier that um, I think kind of illustrates some of what I've been talking about. So this very beautiful chart that I made um, shows kind of our rate of no-shows throughout the past year. Um, and what I really want to point out is sort of that second half of the fall 2019 semester where we see this massive spike um, in no-show appointments. And this was related to basically exactly what I was just describing. This was a weird week in which um, an English instructor had decided to require that all of their students make an appointment with a librarian for unspecified research help. Um, so in this, you know, it was about a week, week and a half, we suddenly saw, you know, dozens of appointments coming in all from the same class. And because librarians, um, because our librarians have sort of gotten in more into the habit of work communicating with each other about this, and because, you know, we have not always had a reference coordinator, I'm still you know, relatively newish to this position. Um, so we have someone actually overseeing our appointments. Uh, we were able to identify the course and the instructor where all of these appointments were coming from and reach out to clarify uh, sort of what a research appointment is, what they're for, and brainstorm other solutions here. So as Carolyn mentioned earlier, um, when appointments are required, we often see a much higher rate of no-shows, which we certainly did in this instance, you know, of the dozens of appointments that we received, very few of them actually showed up. Largely, I think, because students didn't know why they were making an appointment and therefore didn't consider it to be very valuable. Um, so even though this did sort of skew our numbers in a way that makes them look a little bit exciting, I actually think this is a really good um, illustration of sort of how some of the work that we've been doing can kind of make a difference in real time because we have, fingers crossed, not seen this happen again since that particular intervention. Um, and when you look at our rates of no-shows outside of that sort of blip, um, they have decreased more significantly. So at this point, even though we're, um, this is pre-recorded, um, we're hoping when we come back together, you can ask us any questions you have about um, what we found in either our survey or through our discussions about neoliberalism and our reference model as a whole. And you're welcome to reach out to us using these methods. When we also come back together, we plan to have some discussion um, in small groups likely. Um, and what we'd love to hear, um, so you can start thinking, um, how do you define no-shows and appointments in your own context? Is this something that you deal with as well? Um, what other kinds of reference models exist for you? What kinds of neoliberal language and practices do you see in your library context? Um, and this could be in reference or elsewhere. And how can we improve on or mitigate neoliberalism in our reference policies or elsewhere in the library um, to kind of reframe that we are these educational institutions and serve a different purpose, right? So we look forward to chatting with you more soon. In the meantime, here are some of those references that I mentioned. Um, and we look forward to hearing from you. So, bye.